Hi guys, and welcome to the end. So this is the last week of lectures and we're going to cover one way between subjects analysis of variance. So let's get started. So the first thing is last week we talked about how to compare binary independent variable with a uh, the continuous outcome, right? So two, two means compared with a t-test. Well, t-tests only work comparing pairs at a time, right? So group one to group two, but what if you have group three, right? You can really only also have one predictive variable that has a binary outcome, a binary grouping. But there aren't many scenarios where that is the only, only case you have. Right? Maybe you have multiple variables, independent variables, or maybe you have three groups or eight groups. So what we'll do instead is an ANOVA. <clears throat> so ANOVA stands for the analysis of variance and it allows us to compare several means at a time. Okay? It also allows us to use more than one independent variable, meaning multiple variables, much like we did with multiple regression. So we went from correlation, one IV, one DV, to regression with multiple IVs and one DV. Same thing with t-tests, one uh, binary IV to multiple IVs are possible. Today we're only going to cover how to do one IV, but you could use multiple IVs. And then the next class picks us up and, and takes you more depth into ANOVAs. And so just don't forget that ANOVA is a special form of regression. This is the general linear model. And so we could run all of these using the LM function, but there are other ways to um, interpret these and um, that people traditionally use them. So we make sure you can understand how to do it both ways. So why not just use a bunch of t-tests? You know, let's say I have six groups. I could do one versus two, one versus three, one versus four and on. So why, why wouldn't I do that? Okay. So especially with three groups, it becomes very easy. It's one versus two, two versus three, and one versus three. Okay. Well, the problem with that is that I can't actually independent, uh, compare several independent variables at once and examine their interactions like we did a moderation and regression. So problem number one. But problem number two is that the use of multiple t-tests can inflate type one error. And so we have here down here a little um, equation, but the equation on the next slide is better. But just an idea, if I have three groups, instead of having one omnibus or overall test, if I use t-tests, I'm stuck with three different little mini tests. And so the formula, although the picture is from the field, but the formula is technically one minus, one minus alpha. And we often set alpha to 0.05, so hence some 95 in there, to the C. Okay. C here is the number of comparisons. So um, what we could do is we could calculate the, the error rate if we just used a bunch of t-tests. Okay. So if you have three groups, that's three possible comparisons, okay. one versus two, one versus three, and um, two versus three. And that gives you a uh, type one error rate, if you don't do anything else, of 0.14. We're trying to keep our type one error rate set to alpha, which is 0.05. So this automatically triples that rate nearly. That's no good. If you move up to four comparisons, four groups, that's six possible comparisons. That gives you a quarter of, of a type one error rate. And then with five groups, you are at 40% for your type one error rate. So this is no good. We would like to do something that con continues to control for type one error and allows us to test multiple IVs and all of our groups at once. So that's where ANOVA comes in. Now, ANOVA is regression. Okay? I think I've said that like a hundred times this semester, but I just wanna make this clear. We're gonna do this as a special kind of structured analysis, but it is still the general linear model and it's still regression. And a regression is often used to think about if my overall model is good at predicting some outcome. Okay. So there's this framework around it where we're thinking about predicting, predicting why. Okay. 
And ANOVA used in sort of experimental research with categorical predictors is often thought like, did, are there any group differences on the DB? These mathematically are the same, but what we do is just frame the hypothesis question differently, right? So in regression, we're asking, can I predict the outcome? Okay. And which predictor is the most important? In uh, ANOVA treated as like sort of traditional ANOVA, which we're about to do, it's treated more as a question of, are there group differences? Because all of our IVs are categorical. So essentially traditional ANOVA is a special case of regression where all the IVs are categorical. Okay. And then we do have a spot in the middle, sometimes called ANCOVA, where you do half and half, but at that point you might as well just call it regression. Um, so ANOVA, right? Just remember, mathematically equivalent to regression, but it's the special case where everything is categorical and the outcome or dependent variable is continuous. All right, but even if I'm asking if there are differences in group performance, right? So are there um, differences in my outcome variable based on which group I put you in? Basically, I'm asking, can I predict a change in behavior they, or the DV based on group? And that's actually the same question, but these get framed fairly differently and people treat them like they're two different planets. Um, so uh, we, we show both to really make it clear, like uh, regression is very flexible, right? But if you have completely categorical outcomes, this is sometimes a little easier to run and interpret. All right, so what are we doing when we have this, um, the null hypothesis testing the framework when it's traditional ANOVA. So the null hypothesis is still something, there's no effect, there's no differences in means, there's nothing happening. Okay. And really we're saying that our IVs don't predict the DV because there's no group differences in those IVs. Okay. So I can't tell who, what group you're in because there's no differences in the means. And we don't really predict where there might be differences in the means because this is an F test and we're gonna get way more into what an F test is now. We briefly touched on it in the regression chapter. But remember that T, our nice, almost normal distribution T squared is F. So we don't really do directional hypotheses because one, we're not predicting any particular differences in the means just yet. And two, it's all squared. <laughs> so it's the analysis of variance, remember variance is squared. So there's only one tail to talk about. Now, the other hypothesis is that there is a difference between means. I'm not gonna say where, and you'll see why in a minute, but just that there is. And that's because uh, ANOVA is an omnibus test. Okay, omnibus is such a weird word. It's an overall test. Okay. It tests all of the means at once, and tells you if there's a difference anywhere. So if you get a significant ANOVA saying you reject the null hypothesis that there are no differences in means, that implies that somewhere one of these is different from the other. But you gotta figure out where, I don't tell you where. And that's very similar to our idea of regression and the overall model. The overall model predicts better than chance, or right, better than zero, or the, the y-intercept. ANOVA says, well, there's something somewhere. And then in regression, we followed that up with, okay, which predictor was the most important? And ANOVA, we're gonna follow that up with post hoc tests. Which group is it that's different from everybody else? And so the omnibus test idea is this is this overall global picture. Can I, you know, is my R squared greater than zero? It tells us that those group means are different, but not where. Okay, so we do have to follow it up just like we had to follow up um, regression, or if you remember from the moderation section, we had to, um, you know, run that interaction and then do something else to see what happened. All right, last lecture on signal to noise. How does it work in this scenario? Well, we're going to still have our model, the variance explained by the model, the experiment in this case, um, or any, any of these groups. Okay, the models, these different groups, 
as a ratio to the error in the model, which is often considered individual differences. Okay. The other stuff, we don't know how, why people differ within their group. And since ANOVA focuses on groups, the models often consider the mean differences between groups. Okay, just like t-tests, we took, we subtracted those two means. And the error is all that variability within groups. Okay, so when we did our t-test, we took like a weighted average of the variability between the two groups and between subjects t. It's going to be approximately the same idea here in ANOVA. We just have more than two groups because okay, so we're expanding t here. And that ratio of um, modeled error differences in means to um, variability within groups is called the F ratio. Okay. And we're hoping that the model explains a lot more variability than um, the noise. So models, be signals better than noise. Then we can say our experimental manipulation or our groups have some sort of significant effect on the outcome, which is a fancy way of saying that their groups are different somehow. Their means are different. Now the F ratio specifically in ANOVA is a measure of the variance created by, because we're gonna use the word manipulation because we're kind of focusing on ex traditional experiments here, but it's the, the variance created by our groups. Okay. So group one has a mean over here, group two has a mean over here, group three has a mean way out here. And so there's variability in the means for the groups. And these are often called levels or conditions, depending on the type of ANOVA. Okay. And so if I just take the group means, are they variable or are they not? Okay, that's our model. And so I'm going to call this good variance. It's systematic variance. I know why it's different because they're in these different groups. Okay. And then the bottom of the ANOVA formula is the variance created by our unknown factors. This could be the time of day, it could be how you're feeling, it could be that you're just a different person than somebody else in this group. It could be some unknown variable that we haven't measured. So this is a bad variance because I don't know how to explain it. Okay. So it is unsystematic. I, I don't have a, a procedure for which to explain it. And so to do this kind of magic signal to noise ratio, what we're gonna do is we're say, okay, how much variance is there total? So in our regression section, we drew these kind of Venn diagrams that talked about effect sizes, but this is a similar way to the F ratio working. Okay, so how much variance is there total? Okay. I usually talk about this as cookies in a jar. <laughs> so how many cookies do we have? And that's our sum of squares. Because remember, analysis of variance, okay, we talked about variance the top half of the variance formula is called the sum of squares because we take each score minus the mean and square it. I know that was like 11 weeks ago, but bring that idea back, right? The, the variance formula has the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. The F ratio, same, same idea. So the sum of squares, we just calculate how much variance is there total? Ignoring groups, ignoring people, just like how much variance is there in our DV? Take that total and partition it out. Okay. How much of that total is due to my model? So we're going to call this sum of squares model. This has a lot of names depending on who you learn this from. Sometimes this is called sum of squares between. I try not to use that term because this gets confusing with between subjects research designs. So sum of squares model. Okay. And this is the uh, variance due to our IV, our groups. Okay. Then how much cannot be explained? Sum of squares residual. Sometimes you'll see this as error, okay. sometimes called within, which is a bad name. <laughs> so um, we're just going to call it residual, just like in our regression models called residuals, that error term that we, how far off we are predicting people. And so if there are group differences, the models can explain much more variance in sum of squares model than sum of squares residual. Okay. Now, it's not a simple ratio of SS model to SSR residual because those two numbers have a different number of things in them. Right? Your sum of squares model is based on the number of groups you have. 
It's the variance between group means. Okay, so if you have three groups, it's only three numbers. Okay. Sum of scores residual is based on the participants. So if you had 10 people in each group, that's based on 30 numbers versus three. You can't quite compare those. So one last reminder that statistics is the love of standardizing things. So we first kind of deal with the fact that those have a different set of numbers in them. How? Degrees of freedom. So this is an analysis of variance. Variance formula is sum of squares over degrees of freedom. So we're gonna calculate variance for our model, sum of squares over degrees of freedom, variance for our residual, sum of squares over their degrees of freedom. The F ratio is that, okay? Variance for our model divided by variance for our error. Okay. We've got a special term that we use for this, we call it mean square model and mean squared residual. And that just denotes that those have been divided by their degrees of freedom. So uh, mean squared error is a really popular term like business people or stocks, financial people like to use. Okay. Um, and they're talking about this kind of dealing with uh, the difference here between uh, the calculations. So let's look at an example of this practically. Now, we won't ever do one of these by hand because there is literally no point, <laughs> right? The computers do it for us, but let's just kind of see how this idea plays out. Okay. And so for our last textbook example, we have the effects of Viagra on libido. Okay, we have three groups. We give some of them a sugar pill, some of them a low dose, and some of them a high dose. Then we measure the sort of objectiveness, the libido scores. All right, so I've imported that data. Let's just look at a structure. So we've got a participant number, a, a dose, which we'll have to make sure that we transform into a, a factor variable, because right now it's a number, because we've imported this from a SPSS file. And then our libido scores is our dependent variable. So here I'm just factoring that variable. Now, the nice thing about keeping this in an order is this is somewhat continuous. So we're actually going to look at how to um, sort of test if this is linear or not, right? So we could just run a regression and treat this as one, two, three, but uh, we know that these, that's not like perfectly linear, but for analyses where the uh, categorical groups are sort of somewhat continuous, we can run an analysis to determine the shape of their um, effects. So are they linear? Are they curvilinear? Are they cubic, right? <clears throat> All right, well, this came out really large. <laughs> so sum of squares total, like how do we calculate a, the total variance? Well, that is like blessedly easy, right? We're gonna take all of our, our libido scores where the X here remembers each participant minus the grand mean. Okay, grand mean is just like if you calculated the mean on the column, ignoring group. And then there's some like mathematical transforms of how this technically works, right? Um, but one thing to notice here is that we're gonna normalize for participants. And so we know that the uh, formula for variance is sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. Okay. And so this kind of like has worked itself backwards. So our total sum of squares, right, is 43 points. Okay. And that's each person minus the gram mean squared. Okay. All right, now that's calculated by grabbing the gram mean, the gram mean is this bar here. This is group one, group two, group three. And it's just calculated by subtracting each person minus the gram mean. And so ignore these lines here, we're gonna come back to those in a second. It's overall variability. This, this is literally just the top half of the variance formula um, on our dependent variable column. Now, the degrees of freedom are, again, remember the number of values that are free to vary. And we've calculated the grand mean, so we've lost one. And so it's just n minus one. 
And so here, degrees of freedom total would be n minus one, which in our case, we have 15 participants, minus one, 14 degrees of freedom total. Now, we have the total 43 points, right? And then we have the total degrees of freedom, 14. Now we're gonna break those up. We're gonna take our cookies and start giving them out to people, okay? And hopefully we give more cookies to the model group than we do to the error group, right? Because we want our model to be more of the variance, more rewards. Now, our sum of scores for model is the variance due to the means. And so um, that this formula here is the X bar sub I. So group one, so our low dose minus the gram mean, our, or I'm sorry, the placebo minus the gram mean, the low dose minus the gram mean, the high dose minus the gram mean squared. This little sneaky in here gets involved because the groups might have different sample sizes. Okay, so we have to account for that. In our case, they have the same sample size, but that is just because it's a magic made up example and that is not always how these things work. So we do have to account for sample size differences. Okay, so there's a lot of adjusting for where the people are in the study. That, this is variance on the means. Before we calculated variance on the people, okay, ignoring what group they're in, now we're calculating the variance on the means. So we've just moved up a level. Okay. If the logic here is, if there are no group differences, the variance for our model will effectively be zero. They all have the same mean. And our ANOVA won't work because there are no group differences. So the null is true. If there are group differences, we'll see those group means get further apart. And then our model will have more signal and the null is false. Okay, there are group differences. And that is the same concept as T because T is just one mean minus the other. So if the means are equal, you're gonna get almost no signal. If the means aren't equal, you'll get the larger difference. And so I find ANOVA, like, well, I think it's just fancy regression. I found it to be quite clever because the idea here is that we're just taking that variance formula and changing um, the number of variables, right? So we went from having um, two means, so just subtract them. Oh no, now I have three means. How do I figure out the differences between them without just subtracting. So I did one minus two minus three, that wouldn't mean anything, right? I don't know what negative two means there, right? Oh, well we have, I have a statistic to calculate how different things are, it's variability. So we're going way back to the beginning of the semester and taking variance and bringing it back. Okay, that's why it's called the analysis of variance. It's variances in the groups divided by variances in the people. And then that's how this mathematically works out. It's 20 points. All right, now visualizing this, what I'm doing is for each person, I'm subtracting the uh, group mean minus the gram mean. Okay. And you have to do this by person um, simply because there might be different numbers of people in each group. Okay. So each person group mean minus the gram mean, and that's why it doesn't line up with the dot. It's because it's the, the best model we have for each group, which is the mean minus the gram mean. Right. So at this point, we actually don't have to calculate error because it is the sum of squares total minus the sum of squares model. It's whatever's left over. I know how many cookies I have left in my jar. Here, have them. Okay. But we should just make sure to one to prove this works, but also to make sure that we've done this correctly. If you were ever forced to do one by hand, which hopefully is a never. Okay. But first thing, degrees of freedom here. We've talked a lot about degrees of freedom being whatever minus one, right? So sample size minus one, sample size minus parameters. We have one parameter still, the gram mean. So it's sample size minus the gram mean. Well, the sample size here is not the number of participants, it's the number of groups. So it's the number of groups minus one. So we use three means or three levels. So the degrees of freedom for our model is three minus one, so we have two. We had 14 total. We took away two. So let's see where that extra 12 comes in. And then we had 43 points in our grand total variance. And we just used 20, 20 points of it. Let's see where the other 23 points is coming from. 
Now, for sum of squares residual, what we do is we take each person minus their group mean. Okay, so notice here, this is based on their group. When we did sum of squares total, well, that didn't do anything. Now did it. Okay, why are you being mean? Sum of squares total. All right, fine. Do it the hard way. Sum of squares total, we took each person minus the grand mean. Okay, that ignores group. Now we're saying, okay, well, why are you different from your own group? Okay. And so the variability within groups is something we can't explain. The variability between groups we assume is due to the groups. Variability inside the group. Mm. So this might be, again, time of day. So who knows they're feeling bad that day. It might be because we had, we randomly assigned some weird people in each group, who knows? Okay, so this is our error term. So we take each person minus the uh, group mean and square that up. And so that mathematically sort of works out to being the variance um, for each group times its degrees of freedom. And I won't show you the math on that, it's really quite gross, or well, I will, it'll be somewhere else, but um, we would calculate that variance for each group times its degrees of freedom. And really here is what we're doing. So is it not on the bottom? I thought I, I thought I had this picture on the bottom, but where it had all the numbers in it. <clears throat> Oh, it's down here, it's on the wrong slide. Sorry about that. So, uh, you know, the difference here between each group mean. So we've taken the difference of each dot minus the grand mean, each line minus the grand mean, and now each dot minus its group mean. Because we don't know why some people are higher and some people are lower in each group. And so here's that math. So there's our other 23 points. The degrees of freedom, well, how many values did we use? Well, there's 15 total participants, but we have to calculate one mean for each group. So it's n minus one plus n minus one plus n minus one. So five minus one, so four, 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 and that's where 12 comes in. So we use two degrees of freedom for our model, 12 degrees of freedom for our residual, add those two up, we've got 14 degrees of freedom total. So one last check, does it add up? I hope so, <laughs> it's a book example, right? So it does add up. And this is where it's very tempting to start to look at this as a signal to noise ratio of our model to our residual. Okay? And you would be like, oh no, we have, way, we have more error than we do model. But remember, these have different amounts of numbers in them. So we've got to convert them to what's called mean squares. And so mean squared model and mean squared error uh, residual, sometimes just overall called mean squared error. It's just dividing, finishing out the variance formula. And you're like, well, why didn't you just, why didn't we just calculate variance from the beginning? Okay. Partially because we're gonna use these sum of squares numbers for our effect size. And so people traditionally keep them kind of separate in these nice, cute, what are called um, uh, summary tables because the, the other pieces of the numbers get used in different places. Um, but I agree with you, <laughs> just calculate the variance, especially if you look at some of these formulas, because it's like, oh, well, this is variance, you know, then let's just do all this magic multiplication over here and then that's what it out. So we're gonna end up dividing by N minus one. So why didn't we just leave it like this? <laughs> you yeah, know, I agree with you, but, um, the real reason is because we're going to use sum of squares separately without dividing by the degrees of freedom. So it's helpful to have that number. Okay. So, okay, ready knows. We're going to divide by two. Okay. This one we're going to divide by 12 because they have very different sample sizes, so to speak, and we love to normalize things. So now we have a 10 to two ratio. And the F ratio is just a measure of the variance in the groups divided by the variance in the models, okay, our mean squares. So our F ratio here is five to one, okay, or 10 to two, however you like it. And so we have to figure out now if five, 
here as the standardized value is different from chance, okay? Or is that ratio large enough signal to noise? So what most people do, and, and you'll see this in the output in R here, is they make these cute little summary tables. Okay. And these summary tables are, are really nice. You don't always see the total, right? Sometimes because it's the total. So, people, so you'll still normally see model and residual. And it'll depend on what package you use, how they write these out. But what we see is we can kind of see where all the parts and pieces come in, right? So how many participants? Okay, this. 2 and 12 is where we get our uh, degrees of freedom when we write the F statistic out, right? The sum of squares is how we're going to calculate effect size. So this like little block right here, while it seems silly to keep it separate, um, when we could just calculate the variances directly, because this is just the variance for means and the variance for groups, right? This is useful information later. So that's why people keep them separate. All right, so how do I interpret F? Well, everything is based on variances, so F is, is never negative. Okay? It's not negative in regression because regression, again, this is a special version of regression. It's, it's never negative. T values can be negative okay? because it, it's just the subtraction of group one minus group two in the, in, as our model. So depending on what order you put them in, they could, it could be negative. Okay? But F values are never negative because they're T squared. And so let's think about this for a second. If we're saying, so this logic here of signal to noise to kind of round out this whole conceptual semester of thinking about what do test statistics mean? Okay, they're always a ratio of signal to noise. If my F value is small, I am arguing model and error are equal. And it's just a bunch of noise. We cannot tell the differences. Like there's no, we can't tell why people are what they are right, with our independent variable. It's all just a bunch of variability. If that value is large or models large, larger than error, we can tell why some people are different from others. It's because of these different groups. And so we're finding an effect. Our means are different. Okay? Our model where we represent each group with a different mean is useful. In the first scenario, our models of using the mean as the representation doesn't mean anything because they're all the same. All right, so let's pause there to keep these from being way too long <laughs> and take a brief mental break and come back and talk about the assumptions and actually do one of these in R. And then we'll have a third video that covers post-talk tests.